Uh, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this conference, which is part of our seminars on Asian religions and which effectively closes the seminar for, for this academic year. Um, I would like to thank our Students Association Geshin and especially Lorenzo, Sabrina and Irene who organized this conference. And I now give the floor to Lorenzo who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Professor. Good evening to everybody. I'm Lorenzo Sgrevi, a member of the Student Association Geshin, and I'm here with uh, Sabrina Pellegrini, president of the association. We are a team of um, Kafoskari students who organize events and workshops uh, dealing with Japanese studies, and we the aim to create a network of students and scholars of Japanese language and culture. I'm so glad to introduce Professor Kohn today, one of the most important proliferous researcher of Taoist studies, and I want to thank uh, her for accepting our invitation. We are more grateful than I can say to have you here today. Well, for those of you who might not be familiar with uh, her work, uh, Professor Olivia Kohn uh, spent 10 years in Kyoto University doing research about uh, Chinese Taoism and she joined the Boston University as Professor of Religion and East Asian Studies, and now she is retired from active teaching. Today, she is an uh, executive director of the Journal of Taoist Studies, and uh, she manages the Three Pines Press. Um, the lecture of today deals with uh, the Japanese developments of a Chinese cult uh, called in Japanese a Koshin Shinko, it will be around 45 minutes long uh, with a Q&A at the end. And therefore, I would ask to hold off question until then, uh, when you'll be able to interact by using the microphone or uh, writing in the chat, uh, whichever you prefer. Also, I would like to remind everybody that this lecture will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, Geshen Kafoska University. And this said, I would like to thank again Professor Rivados and Professor Kohn, and I, I leave you to enjoy the lecture. So, Professor, can you start whenever you are ready? Um, hello and welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll be happy to share some of my research on the Koshin Shinko, the Koshin cult, which is originally a Taoist cult, but was transmitted into Japan. So our topic is Japanese developments of a Taoist cult. And on the first slide, you can see my email address, which you are welcome to contact me directly if you have any questions or um, comments uh, later, or also about other topics and Taoist studies. And the company that I run, um, you will find many books and also a journal on Taoist studies on this website is threepintspress.com. So to start with, um, we will look at the general idea of Chinese culture where heaven is considered to be round and the earth is considered to be square. And so in other words, you have a square base for earth and then a round dome that covers it which makes the earth and heaven the universe look like a turtle so you see on the right how the shape of the turtle is matching the shape of heaven and earth now the human body in the system is um, an imitation a replica a miniature of heaven and earth and so the Taoist text Huainanzi, which goes back to the second century BC, has a description that talks about how the head is round and it's like heaven and the feet are sort of square in their basic outline and that matches the earth. And so just as heaven has four seasons, five agents or phases or elements, nine directions, 360 days. So people also have four limbs, five internal organs, nine body openings and 360 acupuncture points. And just as heaven 
or nature has different kinds of weather. So the human beings have different kinds of actions and also different emotions. And then different organs correspond to specific natural phenomena, such as the gallbladder to the clouds, the lungs to the breast, the liver to the wind, the kidneys to the rain and the spleen to thunder. So we have the basic understanding that the body is a miniature version of the cosmos. And in a little more organized form, um, recorded in a early alchemical Taoist text called Bao Puzi, which goes back to the fourth century uh, AD, um, talks about how the body is an organized structure. And this is very important for our understanding of the Koshin cult because it talks about certain um, administrators and officials within the body. So the human body is like a state. The diaphragm is the imperial city, which is the muscle that divides the upper um, chest area from the lower abdomen. Um, arms and legs are suburbs and frontiers. Bones and joints are like officials. Inner gods are sovereign. The blood is like minister of state. The breast is like the population. And so the idea is that if you regulate your body, you can also regulate the state. So there's a very close connection of the administration of state and the internal organization of the body. Take, take good care of the population is the best way. And so by the same way, nurturing the breath is and keeping the body whole is very important. And so anything that is dying cannot be living. Anything that is perishing cannot be in a state of preservation. So your ideal is to support life and to extend your life expectancy. So that was generally um, are very uh, concerned about dying early and of getting sick. So they really want to make sure that you will have, um, that you do what you can to keep your body whole. Um, internally, we do have deities, and these are like officially like an administration. They're officials in an organization. And so here again is the Balpuza, the same text. The eight gods of the lungs are the masters of great harmony. They're called the secretaries of the palace of jade purity. They govern 3,600 minor officials, ride in carriages of white energy or vital energy chi, drawn by white tigers. The white tiger is the emblematic symbol. It's a constellation in the sky and it's the emblematic symbol of the west and the lungs. Occasionally, they'll also write on white dragons. And then very similarly, you have gods of the heart, and they're strategists. They're called uh, original luminant ones, or old ones from the south. They're associated with the color red um, and with the direction of the south. And they also have the um, emblem of the red bird. And so it goes on with the different directions. So all the different deities, they're different deities in all different directions and they're organized um, in a structural system. Here's an illustration from a highest clarity text um, from about the fifth century, where you can see how the individual person is a meditator and all the different organs with their deities are connected to this person. So part of the practice was to visualize these deities, to invite positive celestial energies, good quality chi, good quality power into the body to connect to the divinities and to um, have the body be as part of this divine cosmos. Now within this body, we also have a vertical structure which we call elixir fields. There's three of them. Uh, the Chinese is Dan Tian, um, sometimes also called cinnabar fields. And so we have a, an elixir field and a major, you could call it like an energy vortex in the head and then one in the chest and one in the abdomen. And so the three head, chest and abdomen are called the upper, medium and lower elixir fields. And they're like in the center, they're like little knobs, little vortexes of energy in the center of these areas. And they correspond to heaven, humanity and earth 
in the greater structure of the universe. Uh, there are certain particular palaces that they're named. So it's the Niwan Palace in the head, the Scarlet Palace, again, the heart being the color red, and the Gate of Destiny um, in the lower abdomen. And they're also associated with Qi. So the Cavern of Qi is in the chest area where vital energy resides, and the Ocean of Qi or vital energy is in the lower abdomen. If you're translating these into modern Western, terms, the upper elixir field matches the brain, where you have mental reactions and reactions like emotions. Um, the central elixir field matches the thymus gland in the solar plexus heart area, where your immune system resides. And the belly brain matches the lower abdomen, the lower elixir field, uh, where you have a whole other level of nervous system and brain kind of um, neurons. Um, in the Taoist system, people, you see the three elixir fields here in the head, chest, and abdomen. And then practitioners move energy up and down through these elixir fields and also around the torso and even into the legs along central meridians or energy lines to harmonize and create good quality energy in these energy centers. The Taoists, in addition, believe that there are three deities that reside in the three elixir fields. And the three, um, they're called the three ones. The idea of oneness or unity um, being the idea of connecting to the cosmos at large. So there's like the underlying um, power of the universe is symbolized and focused in these three deities. And they're called the celestial emperor, the cinnabar sovereign, and the primordial king. And they each um, have thousands of soldiers and other guards and entities for protection. And so if you bring these deities into your elixir fields, you're very strongly protected. You're um, connected to the heavens. And they are born directly from primordial energy of the universe. They govern 24 fundamental body powers, which also match the 24 energy phases of the solar year and 24 major constellations in the sky. And they're related to all kinds of different forces and divinities. And so we have in Taoism also the three pure ones. And here's a picture of the three pure ones. The deities of the highest heavens in Taoism and representatives of the different kinds of scriptures. And so the three pure ones and the three ones um, have a relationship where celestial power sent, is being activated in the elixir fields of the person. Then we have another set of three called the cloud souls. Um, the Chinese word is hun. And the, um, the main center of these cloud souls is the liver. Um, they're young in nature and are a directional specific um, aspect of cosmic spirit. And the, the souls, the um, cloud souls or spirit souls pull people towards heaven, purity and goodness. Um, they enhance artistic, intellectual and spiritual growth govern interaction with other people and um, thrive on kindness and, and other um, uh, positive energies. And when the person dies, the cloud soul is the part that resides in the ancestral tablet, whereas a more material dimension called the material soul rests with the corpse. And here's a picture of the three cloud souls. They're depicted as official looking um, genteel kind of figures. Their names are sublime essence, white radiance, and guiding power. So they're very positive forces. Um, and they're not directly related to the three elixir fields and the three ones, but they're also a, a set of three spiritual entities that live in the body and are supportive and, and um, create positive energy for uh, the person. Activate the souls, um, you um, 
you, you, you visualize them as looking like human beings wearing green robes with yellow in their garments. And there are certain days, the 3rd, 13th, and 23rd, that's the lunar months. Um, the belief is that they leave the body in the evening to go wandering around the heavens. And they also make reports and connect to other officials. So you have to be asleep for the souls to be able to go up um, to do that. And ideally, if you're aware of this fact, you can lie down with your feet raised and your head is supported by a pillow, your legs are st uh, straight, and you fold your hands over your heart, you close your eyes and hold your breath for a little bit, click your teeth, and you continue to visualize and to engage with the souls so they um, bring positive energy again into your body. <coughs> Now, here's the negative side of this. There are also three um, so-called death bringers. Um, the Chinese is Sun Shi, and technically the word Shi means corpse. So they're the three corpses, but they're not corpses, they're not dead. There's three semi-divine official entities that live in the human body that will make you into a corpse. And so we call them death bringers. They're bio-spiritual parasites that destroy the three elixir fields from within. And so there are three of them. And again, they're like the three ones um, uh, associated with those three elixir fields. They're officials of the celestial administrations and in particular, they're agents of a department um, run by the director of destiny. And that's like one aspect of the celestial administration. And the celestial administration puts them in the human body to monitor your thoughts and behavior. So it's like an internal um, kind of mechanism to see whether your thoughts and your actions are good or bad. So there's a moral quality um, in this system. And then they report to their superior in the heaven once every two months. Um, and, um, they, and while they're doing this, it's, it's not just a reporting function. These are not just um, recording entities, but they do have a vested interest in make you do evil. They do everything they can to get the person to do bad things because once the person does bad, the, the logic is that if you're doing bad deeds, and you become morally um, impure, then you're opening the way to all kinds of bacteria and, and negative influences um, to enter your body and you will get sick. And then once you get sick, you get very sick and then eventually you die. And the idea is that after death, those three corpse demons um, have the power to devour the blood, bones, and muscle of the corpse. So they really feed on you, literally, like, um, like you know, negative worms. And then once they have chewed on you and they've ingested the body, they can assume your shape. So they can project themselves into the shape of this person and appear as a ghost. And then they sort of steal the ancestral offerings that your family would be um, laying out to support you. So they're really a very negative <laughs> and nasty kind of um, entity. Here's a picture, and while one of them looked um, like an official with a long robe, the others are sort of demonic looking. Uh, one is a little um, dog type thing was a nasty kind of face. And this other creature is like a animal kind of head with sort of semi horns and then like a leg that the head sits on. So it's a very strange creature. And those are the three death bringers. Um, originally, <coughs> in terms of history, the earliest mention of the three corpses are, is in the Lunghong of the second century um, AD, and they are like three worms. And so the idea of this 
um, parasite that lives in the human body goes back to actual physical worms, like bandworms. And the text says in the human body, there are three worms. They correspond to creatures that live in the marshes beneath the soil. Those are called leeches. Leeches gnaw their way through the feet of people, just as the three worms grow or gnaw through their intestines. Um, so, so they're originally like uh, parasites, actual physical parasites. And they're still in the um, Taoist system, there's nine worms. Um, and it's a little hard to see, but you can see how they have different shapes. Some look like little bugs. Some look like sort of slimy, wormy things. Some have like different kinds of patterns to them. And the nine worms are the assistants of the three death bringers. So they're the agents that you would, um, if you're morally um, wrong, you do evil. Those are the agents that you would enter your body and cause disease. Now, there's a bunch of different things you can do about this. Obviously, Taoists are not happy having these worms around and they want to get rid of them. Um, so there's a number of different things. And again, our text is the Baopuzi, which we mentioned earlier when we talked about the structure of the body as a state. Balpuzza mentions um, asparagus root, poke root, Solomon seal, China root fungus, um, and, and those are substances that contain saponins. Those are poisons that irritate the mucous membrane of the digestive tract and dislodge parasites. So there is like a medical reason why <coughs> those particular herbs are used to eliminate the worms. And then um, the actual quote is, take unadulterated lacquer and you will enter into communication with the gods. Mix it with 10 pieces of crab, take it with mica, which is a mineral, mica water or dissolved in jade water. The nine worms will drop from you and all your bad blood will flow out in nosebleeds, really? So um, the herbal remedy, of um, getting rid of these worms can be pretty radical, but that's one way um, to eliminate them. Um, another part is um, the more spiritual thing, um, and the and worms or the three death bringers go, they ascend to heaven, like I said earlier, every two months. And they do on a particular day, which is known as Gangshan in Chinese and Koshin in Japanese. And what this is, um, this name comes from a particular form of the Chinese calendar. The Chinese calendar has something called a 60 year cycle or 60 day cycle. And the 60, are made up of um, a set of 10 characters, which are called the heavenly stems. And you can see them there. Um, they're called Jia Yi, Bing Ding, Wu Ji, Gang Xin, Wen, and Gui. So those are the 10 um, celestial stems. And they are originally names of days <coughs> of a 10 day week that was common in the Shang Dynasty, which is um, about um, 12, uh, 1500 BC. And then they also have 12 earthly branches that are listed below. And those 12 earthly branches are original Jupiter stations. That is um, a 12 year cycle. It takes the Jupiter, planet Jupiter, 12 years to um, orbit around the sun. And each um, year it's in a different position. And these are the names of those positions. And then they're linked with the zodiac animals, which we're all familiar with um, from the Chinese calendar. And so there's a 60 day com uh, combination. And so we have the ones that are underlined in the slide number seven in the 10 stems is Gong. And number um, nine in the um, 
12 branches is shun or the monkey and that makes it gong shun and in the combined one that is number number 57 so it's the number of seven stem combined with the number nine branch makes it the number 57 of the 60 count cycle and here we have gong shun is chinese koshin is japanese and those are the two characters and it sounds like in the 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 um a lot of Chinese, um, they, they work with words that sound like each other, with homophones. So it sounds like Geng Shen, which means exchange of the gods, exchange of spirit, which means that the gods, that the, the, the parasites travel to heaven and heavenly orders are coming down to earth. So there's like a change. So Gang means change and transformation and Shen the, the character also is originally a character for lightning. And if you look at the character as it is on top of the slide, you will see a, a square um, or a rectangle with a vertical line through it. It's that direction, that connection to heaven from heaven and earth. But it's also associated with the monkey in terms of the zodiac animal. And that is something that becomes important when this entire system gets transmitted to Japan. So the belief is that on the 27th day and essentially on the night of the 27th day um, of this cycle and the day in China, like it depends a lot of times it's midnight, but you're really looking at dawn to dawn. So it's the night of the, of the Gongshan day when the three Deathbringers ascend into heaven to make their report. And then the way it's understood is that they make their report to their administrative superiors, and then the superiors give them the orders to make the person sick. So, so they have to do that report. <clears throat> and like we mentioned earlier, that the three souls on the third, the 13th, and the 23rd day of the months, which is different from the 60 day cycle, but of the lunar months, um, go off traveling. And so the idea is that you have to be asleep so that these entities, these semi-divine spiritual entities can travel out of the body and go on to heaven. So on that basis, um, we do have a number of ideas um, how we can eliminate these death bringers. So one is you can do only good deeds so the death bringers have nothing to report, but that's sort of difficult. Um, you can do meditation practices and visualizations to focus the mind, um, which helps again to create purity and calmness and which gives the death bringers less material. To, um, to report. You can avoid grain, which is another major um, Taoist technique, um, because the Despringers really like um, wheat and rice and beans. Um, that is something they really nourish on. So you can starve them, or you could take some of those herbal remedies we mentioned earlier. Um, they're exorcistic practices, various spells, and especially um, like wands or parts of things that are made from peach wood, uh, which has a very strong anti-demonic powers. So you can try and expel them in a ritual. And then what is becomes over the period of time, let's see, we have the earliest report in the second century, we have more details and remedies in the Baupods of the fourth century. So by like the sixth, seventh century, um, these cults have started to proliferate and the preferred method to eliminate the death bringers is the vigil, which is last on this slide. So you stay awake during the night to prevent the death bringers from leaving the body. And so we have um, one other source that talks about um, the um, internal meditation that goes with this vigil. Um, and the Huang Ting Jing Yellow Court Scripture is a meditation text from the um, third century. It talks about closing the three passes, making fists. Um, passes are gateways where energy leaves and enters the body. 
and then you rinse and visualize yourself swallowing golden fluid and taking in radiance and so you do not need food and the three death bringers will perish for long periods you practice this and you have success now it comes to japan in the ninth century so by the um, Tang Dynasty, which in China begins in the early 7th century. This has been a, quite a popular cult, and people really like these vigils because it's an excuse to have a party, and they get together, and they have vegetarian food, and then they have do some of the meditations and some scripture readings, and they sort of have a good time. And this, all this whole complex is moved to Japan by the ninth century, which is late Tang Dynasty or Heian period in Japan. And as far as we can tell, it was transmitted by Tendai monks who went to obtain Buddha scriptures, but Tian, uh, Mount Tendai, which is um, in Chinese Tiantai, Tiantai Shan, the mountain is in uh, Zhejiang, it's sort of south and east of Shanghai and it's both a Buddhist and a Taoist center and has been um, for all these years. So they also had access to Taoist materials and this would be Taoist kind of medicine, which is exorcistic medicine, where the three worms or three death bringers uh, play an important role. And so we do have the first mentions in Japan in three different sources. Um, the uh, Kanke Monju um, by Sugawara Michizane, who lived in the late 9th century. And then we have a poem in the early 10th century by the Emperor Murakami, contained in the Honcho Monzoi. And then we have the Ishim Po, which is the essential medical mass. It's a very, very important text. It's the late 10th century, Tamba no Yasuyori. And that text has been translated completely into English. And it is full of Taoist materials um, in addition to um, regular medical um, practices. And many Taoist texts that were lost in Japan, in China, um, are, have survived in the Ishimpo. It's a very important resource. So what we see um, references in the late, mid to late ninth century starting up. Um, we have vigils in the Heian period. There are cheerful assemblies on the evening of the Koshin day. And the goal is to stay awake. So you drink, you play games, you tell stories, do poetry. And we do have in 970 a mention of an, a lecture associated with a Buddhist assembly of compassion. Now there is no formal Taoism in Japan. We do have a number of different beliefs that were transmitted. There are notions of immortality. We do have Taoist rituals, um, especially connected to mountains, um, to Shugendo practices. But most of the rituals of the Taoist tradition were integrated into Buddhism in Japan. <coughs> So we do have a particular scripture, the scripture of Lao Tzu on how to observe Koshin and pursue long life, Roshishu Koshin Kyu Cho Sekyo. Um, and this is um, a scripture that also appears in a um, early 11th century collection of Taoist texts in China, but it is, um, yeah, in the Yunqi Qijian, early 11th encyclopedia. And this text is cited in Fujiwara no Yorinaga's Taiki. Um, so that's the mid of the 12th century. So that's a bit later, but we do have this text um, contained in the 11th century in China. So we have an actual textual transmission focused specifically on the nature of the death bringers, um, their qualities, their duties, and the various methods on how to eliminate them. Um, we do have a Taoist ritual that is described in that text where you have a talisman in your hand of the highest lord which would be lord lao you have a seal of holy mountains and so you're holding these are sort of 
a paper uh, written out or stamped pa holy papers in your hands and you invite the sun and the moon to enter your body so it's positive high quality energy and then the sun and the moon with their radiance disturb and um, disperse all the negative turbid energy and open the way for more pure energy and then here it sells to the three death bringers and nine worms and this is a classic formula for addressing demons and um, lower deities swiftly swiftly in accordance with the statutes and ordinances and then these people at, at this point the death bringers have names so you upper death bringer Peng Ju Go, middle death bringer Peng Zhe Go, lower death bringer Peng Chiao Go. So we have um, um, a, a formal rite that comes with uh, various preparations, including these kinds of talismans. Talismans in the Taoist tradition are written symbols. Um, that people um, go into trance and they travel into the heavenly realm and they see writings. Those are original characters as written in heaven. And so here we have, and they're, they're hard to read in the normal kind of way. But on the left one, we have two characters for sun, and then we have all kinds of uh, curv curvatures, but then there's the character for the moon and the character for offering. So it's like the sun, coming into the body and the moon um, accepting offerings and connecting to the person and the one on the right has several characters for um the the one um it has um stars at the top like these dotted lines with dots in between our our stars then there's another character that's sort of like the sun and we do have the character for valuable um shells like the, like money um highly valuable precious things so those are examples of talismans that would be used another feature is that the Hoshin vigil that's linked with a buddhist deity specifically a tantric deity called shoman congo um, in english we call this figure the blue-faced vajrapani and as you can see um, the figure has um, a number of arms, a bunch of weapons, a fairly grim kind of face. And he is, um, he, the, the connection to the Koshin Deathbringer cult is because he fights all kinds of diseases, especially something called Chuan Shi Bing or Den Shi Biu which is, um, if you look at the characters, it means transmit corpse disease. So in other words, corpse induced disease, and we were looking at the three corpses. And so we believe that this deity um, that was associated with the dispelling and elimination of disease, and particularly tuberculosis called um, corpse induced disease, was linked with the three corpses or three death bringers. Um, because of that. And here's a description. His body has four arms. In his left upper arm, he holds a trident, um, like a triangular weapon. In his left lower arm, he holds a cudgel, which is like a baseball bat, kind of a big um, piece of wood to hit people with. In his right upper arm, he has a wheel. His left lower arm, he has a coiled rope. And his entire body is of this blue color. His mouth is wide open, his eyes are red like blood, and he's got three of them. Let's see, yeah, I guess there's three eyes, okay. And um, his hair stands on end like blazing flames, and his head is crowned by skulls. So he's a very vigorous, uh, nasty looking, fully armed, um, aggressive kind of figure. Here's another picture where we can actually see the three eyes, we can see the different arms, we can see the open mouth, we can see the flames surrounding him, and he's sitting on this throne. So it's a, um, a quite vigorous and fiery, aggressive, anti-disease deity. 
Um, so on the basis of the connection with the deity, um, there's not only the vigil, but there's also a formal exorcistic ritual, um, which is the Shoshiki Ho, the exorcisms of the blue-faced one. And we have it um, cited in a text of the late 12th century. Um, it talks about the Koshin scripture, um, but, and it may possibly be transmitted from China, but we're not entirely clear. We do know that it is um, part of the Tendai tradition in its esoteric dimension. Tendai, of course, as we all know, has integrated a number of different Buddhist traditions into its system, including um, Mikyo or esoteric teachings. And so this is part of that. It um, contains many rituals that work on diseases and expel demonic forces. And the Koshin cult at this point is very, it already was, but at this kind is very clearly connected to the active practice in Tendai Buddhism. So it's not just Tendai monks that brought the texts and the materials, but it actually becomes part of the Tendai Buddhist um, active tradition. And then on the other hand, we have the lay version of it, where it's more like a pleasure thing, where ritual becomes part of um, an enjoyment. So we have a Japanese poem from the year 1213, which says, looking at the bright moon, I hold vigil on the Koshin night, sitting pleasantly at a banquet, making waka poems. So people obviously um, did not just use this as to, to get rid of disease and to exercise negative forces, but also to have a good time and enjoy themselves and have a social occasion. As we move on in history, um, the Muromachi period is the heyday of the Koshin cult in Japan. And we have a number of uh, uh, Engi, Koshin Engi, which are local accounts of the practice at different, uh, as different parts of the country, different counties um, have their own records. And many um, temples, Buddhist mainly, mainly uh, Tendai temples, had erected a separate hall, like a Koshin Do, a special hall for Koshin ritual. Um, the aristocracy and the court had all kinds of banquets that related to the Koshin cult. Uh, monks and warriors had their exorcistic ritual, and the people um, in their own little communities under the guidance of local priests and especially Shugendo practitioners would stay awake and have prayers. So the Muromachi was a high heyday um, of this cult and it was very widespread and went all through the different um, layers and segments of the population. Once we get to the Edo period, a whole different dimension starts up and the Koshin cult gets connected to Sadota Hiko. Sadota Hiko is a monkey-faced Shinto kami. And um, the, the, the name, the first part of the a deity's name, Sadu, means monkey. And if you remember the... Um, Koshin, the Shin character of um, the Koshin um, name was the ninth of the um, earthly branches and is the linked to the zodiac animal monkey. So the scholars believe that the connection to Saratahiko was because Koshin was very popular and because the shin part of it was connected to the monkey, the um, link was made to this Shinto deity. And he also has exorcistic powers, um, but he looks like, as you can see, like a very dressed, um, highly um, weaponized and sort of raggy dressed kind of wanderer. Um, and he also is a protector. He's a martial artist. And so we have a figure that's out of the Shinto tradition, uh, localized in different places, but connected to another martial protective deity like Shomen Kongo. 
um, there's, there's a specific Shinto rite that gets associated with Koshin, where offerings are made of rice, sake, vegetables, and fruit, as you would in a regular Shinto ritual, placed on those oshiki. Um, at, as you know, those trays that are raised um, on a base in combination with vases of flowers, um, an incense burner, which of course is not Shinto, but incense burner is uh, Buddhist, but you would still have some incense and candles. And then Kagura or sacred dances and Norito chanted prayers would be offered, especially on the Koshin day and Koshin evening to um, get get the worms and the death bringers um, out of people's lives. So you have like a whole Shinto dimension that comes into cult. The uh, practice has survived to the present day. We still have local groups um, that practice them, either focused on a particular temple, um, on their local shrine. In some cases, it's clan-based. In others, it's neighborhood. Um, usually, it's preceded by a written announcement. So um, I'm sure in this day and age, it would be posted online to have, yes, you know, we're having um, a caution night coming up, and you are, you're welcome to join us. A banner is hoisted in the location where the meeting is being held. And by late afternoon, people arrive and they bring various um, things. And there's also food. It's sort of like a potluck thing. Many bring a special cake associated with um, the cult or maybe make a little money contribution. And at six um, in the evening, there's a ritual, a vegetarian meal. People chat and then they tell stories, play games. And then by midnight, they have a huge service, which is on the beginning of the Koshin day, and they invite Shomen Kongo, um, the deity or worship Sarta Hiko, um, as a protective sort of defense of deity to um, fight the battle and make sure they stay away, so awake so the um, death bringers cannot leave. And by five in the morning, um, it's over. The deity is sent off and people go home. <clears throat> we do have um, chants that are typically um, offered at the time of the ritual, and Shokera is the assistant of the um, deity of Shomen Kongo. So um, the uh, invocation says, when the three death bringers ascend to prevent them from doing any harm, monkey of Kanoe, big monkey, small monkey, medium monkey, great monkey, come. So they're, they're, they're um, inviting um, the deity and with his assistant to join them and to make sure the death bringers, um, they're actually preventing the death bringers from ascend. When the death bringers are ready to ascend, come and, and prevent them from doing any harm. Then there's another main chant, um, Lord Peng, eternal Peng, cursor of life, vanish completely into the dark realm, get away from my body. So, so the, the idea is that as you, if you hold the vigil once, the death bringers cannot ascend and they will not receive orders. So they're sort of floundering. And then if you do it again after two months, then they get weaker because they do not receive orders to nourish on your bad deeds. And so they're starting to sort of fade away and just to starve. And you have to do it like six or seven times in a row and then they're gone. So the idea is to vanish into the dark realm and get away from the body. So your body will be free of the death bringers. And here's the concluding chant, um, actions. This is a more Buddhist feeling to it. Actions are impermanent like flowers in the fall. This life is bound to pass, scattered in the wind. Life passes, all, all passes, always passes, hidden in the clouds of pleasure. So this is like a more Buddhist um, chant at the end, emphasizing the transitoriness of life and of um, activities. Um, the Shitenoji, which is one of the Buddhist temples in Osaka, has um, 
its own Koshin Hall, and this is it, um, and the side uh, part of the temple. So we still have this. And then every two months on the Koshin day, they have a whole health fair where they hold a special ritual in the hall invoking the blue-faced Vajrapani. There's many booths that are set up um, um, all along the temple um, grounds that are selling. It's like a, like a, like a, a market. They're selling household utensils, clothes, incense, pickles, all kinds of other things. And one thing that they really um, like or that is very popular in Osaka is this Koshin Konyaku. And you see a picture here. Uh, konyaku is a jello-like substance. It's, it's, it's pretty squishy, made from sweet potatoes. And what they do is they, they sort of would slice it thin and they cut it so it would look like worms. So it's like you're eating these healthy worms to eliminate and get rid of the um, spiritual worm. Um, so people do various kinds of things. They stroll through the alleys of stalls, um, eat their konyaku, um, which is steamed or sometimes fried, and other um, snacks. Then they have like a monkey figurine that's like a foot, 30 centimeters tall, um, with like a round head. And so people, it's like a little massage that they get. So And it's like the monkey figurine, of course, um, connecting to the monkey deity. Um, again, it uh, stimulates the blood flow and eliminates um, negative chi. And then they move to another tent and they have, um, as you know, the, the Japanese like these little wooden tablets called goma. And you can, um, you have like monkey figurines um, on these goma tablets and then you can write your wishes on the back of those. And, you know, let me be free from all the death bringers. Let me be healthy kind of thing. And then you hang them up and eventually they're burned in a sacrificial fire. And then they go, being a Buddhist temple, they go and burn incense in the main hall and light candles and offer prayers. So you have, and it's quite popular. There's some, especially older people, but um, all kinds of people come and spend time um, on the Koshin um, day to activate. And then you have rituals inside the temple where the Buddhist priest beats the gong um, and the drum on the right. And there's special sutras and, and dharani spells that are chanted. Um, he and uh, transmits worshippers prayers for health, long life, healing, harmony, and um, as they write out on their special paper tablets. And then there's other priests that sell charms um, and the usual, you know, Japanese uh, temple activity pouches for traffic safety. The special pendants with a monkey on it. Um, so you can carry the monkey, uh, have it around your neck. You can have wooden plaques. There's the arrows, um, like you would also have at New Year's rituals to ward off illness, as well as special cone-shaped envelopes against thieves and special Koshin tea cakes. And I think we're at the end here. So we're having um, a long history of this cult going back to um, almost the Han Dynasty and 200 AD and then the major first major mentions in the four in the fourth century fifth fourth century and then um the whole chinese development where we already have the connection to the tantric deity but then on the japanese side we have this really vast growth of this cult it, it grew in japan to a much wider distribution than it ever reached in China, um, where you have in the Muromachi period, every segment of the society participating, some in really formal banquets at the aristocratic level, some in more esoteric rituals for the monks and the warriors, and some in more little community activities. And then it flows into this whole Shinto dimension, which is very uniquely Japanese. Um, and then there's the modern situation where it's part of Buddhism um, and part of the um, neighborhood associations where you have local associations and you have um, temple activities. The example here is Osaka, but there's other temples 
that have coaching halls and coaching activities. So it's a, it's a Taoist cult in its basic nature has remained unchanged, but in a very, in its specifics with the different deities and the different kinds of rituals. And obviously konyaku is a very Japanese thing. And, and these um, kinds of uh, talismans and spells and little pouches and things that are very uniquely Japanese. So it's really got integrated into um, Japanese religious um, society. So thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, thank you for your meaningful lecture. I was personally very intrigued with the connection between microcosm and microcosm and macrocosm and body state. Actually, I found very interesting the topic of the cult uh, in Japan to begin with uh, and connecting the concept of body and state uh, to the three that bringers is something that to me is truly fascinating. Well, uh, if, I think we can start uh, with the questions, if there are any, and you can either raise your hand and open the microphone or write them in the chat. If there aren't any questions yet, I can be the icebreaker with a question of my own. Uh, I would like to know if there's a development of this cult in contemporary China, and if so, uh, are there any differences with the Japanese one? And the answer is no. Um, this really has, it got transmitted into Japan and then it sort of fell under, there are too many other things going on in China. And so Koshin is not a major issue in, in as a cult, it does not exist in China. And um, what you do have <coughs> uh, individual, um, in, uh, individual Taoist practitioners who would, um, use some of the herbal things and some of the exorcistic practices, but you don't have the vigil, you don't have the connection to the deities. Um, none of the, the, as the cult is not there. As a longevity practice, elimination of the death bringers is still important. So, so if um, in a monastic setting, complete perfection practitioners um, work to um, attain higher levels of internal alchemy, the three Deathbringers have to go. And so they still do certain kinds of practices, herbal things, um, certain prayers, meditations, things of that sort. But that's like an individual thing. Like the, this person is ready to get to this next level of internal alchemy and they need to um, do this, but it's not as a cult, it doesn't exist, no. Okay, thank you. Hi, if I may. Hi, Livia. Thank you. Hello. Hi, hi. We met many years ago in Manchester. Yes, yes, I think so. Hi. Very good. Hi, hi. <laughs> um, thank you. This was fascinating. I, I didn't know about the Japanese uh, side of things. And uh, I, just a curiosity, at some point you say in your lecture that uh, Taoist medicine, you call it an exorcistic medicine. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Um, that, that particular that particular branch of the, not all Taoist medicine is exorcistic, but we do have, well, <coughs> let's put it this way. Um, the, the early Taoist cults, um, the early Taoist organizations of the celestial masters believed in something called demon medicine. So the, the and, and it's um, Paul Unschuld, who is the professor of Chinese medicine in Munich University. Um, he's written extensively about this, how early before acupuncture came in, early medicine in China was demon medicine. So the understanding was, and that has continued in these early Taoist cults and it's highly exorcistic. Um, the belief is that you you commit some moral failure or fault, um, sin, and you open yourself up to some noxious influences and demonic, like the whole world was covered, was highly populated in all kinds of demons. And so you would um, invite, these demons would enter your body and they would make you sick. And then 
um, you had to take exorcistic kinds of measures. And the belief actually is, um, there's a book um, in the Joseph Needham series about acupuncture, which is actually a very good history of acupuncture called Celestial Lancets. Mm -hmm. And the lancet is like, you know, a stabbing weapon. And so the idea was that the needles in the very early stages of acupuncture were thought of as weapons to poke at and kill demonic influences. And only after a, a shift happened somewhere around uh, the second century BC, when there's the demonic figures get transmoved, transformed into chi, into energies. And then you start looking at meridians and at energy flow and all that kind of stuff. So, so acupuncture or energy medicine is after the demonic medicine and the Taoists of the second century, the early Taoist cults, continued the older version of this. And, and sort of on a shamanic level, even today, you can go to Taiwan or even mainland China and some people get sick and nothing helps. They go to the temple, the medium goes into trance and then the medium starts to um, do all kinds of exorcistic activities and and get information like which demon is um, has invaded and which deity can be invoked to get rid of this demon and so so it's a it's a popular level of medicine very old <coughs> ancient <coughs> popular level of medicine that has continued and it is dominant in the early Taoist the celestial masters kind of Taoism in the second century AD. And then after that, it sort of coexists with the more acupuncture, energy-based, herbal, you know, and then transformation of chi into spirit, which is all energetic as opposed to demonic. Um, so, so it's a, it's, and, and so the Koshin cult is actually a good example of this um, exorcistic, demonic level continuing yeah. in it's this particular form yeah. thank you okay. uh, you also um, yeah you also use this term bio spiritual which i really like yes uh yeah very very useful to think yes with. Yeah. Yes, bio-spiritual parasites is what we think of them as, because they're bio and as they're parts of the body, but they're also really spiritual entities and, and um, part of the celestial administration. Thank you. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I wanted to thank you once again for your um, lecture and I want to start uh, by reading uh, a question that arrived in the chat, if it's all right with you. Yes, go ahead. Um, Francesco mm -hmm. asked, uh, says, thank you for everything you recently told us. May I ask you a question? Okay. What is the importance of Dao Di Jing in Japanese developments of Taoism? What role the has Dao Di Jing? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the the Tao Te Ching is very very well known in Japan and has been transmitted um, very early on, like when when the in about the seventh eighth centuries, when many Chinese texts were transmitted um, from China to Japan. Um, Tao Te Ching and Zhuangzi also uh, other classical Taoist texts were transmitted, and they're highly honored. And there are many Japanese commentaries to Tao Te Ching and. We have um, you know many renditions and and it's a very it's a very important classical scripture in Japanese learning. Okay, perfect. I think you also answered the what role has the Tao Te Ching played in over time spreading the Taoist cult in Japan. So that's perfect. Yes, yes, it has continued. It's it's a more it's more of a not so much cult. It's more of a philosophical, inspirational text. Um, there's not as much there. There are some people, and I've actually been there. Is a in Kyoto. There's a little shrine um, as part of the Inari mountain, Mount Inari, the fox deity complex. 
there's a Taoist um, temple, little shrine temple there, and it's dedicated to um, to the three pure ones, and includes also a, an image of Lao Tzu. Um, so, but the, the devotional part is less when it comes to Tao Te Ching. Tao Te Ching is not so much a devotional text as a philosophical, inspirational kind of work. Perfect, thank you very much. There's also a question, a question from Michelle, I think it's pronounced, um, who asks, uh, um, uh, we would like to know if, if the, tre the three uh, dead bringers uh, are the only evil figures in Tao that work against humans. What was the question? The three death bringers have are uh, what? <laughs> are the only evil figures in Tao that work against humans. They work against humans. Um, well, well, they, they have, um, they're, 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 ap they're appointed by the celestial administration to keep track of humans. And so it's, it's sort of like, um, and, and as a, as a um, incentive, you know, you want your officials to work efficiently and to be, um, powerful and to do their work and so so in 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 other bureaucracies if somebody does a really good job they get a bonus or they get a promotion or I mean there's certain incentives that are built into uh, bureaucratic organizations and so in this case the incentive is that if the death bringers are very efficient then, <coughs> then they not only report many crimes and and evil thoughts bad thoughts, but they also get to make the human being sick and then eventually they get to feed on that person. So, so they're, um, I don't know if I would talk about them as being against humanity. It's more like a, a mechanism to keep people, make people think about their actions so it's like if you like like and and also it's this idea that it's internal so so it's let's say you commit some evil deed um and nobody knows about it but hey the death bringers are living within you so it's, it's sort of like a conscience like your your moral arbiter your moral judgment sits within yourself so they know and so because the death bringers are within you so it's a way of keeping people or trying to keep people morally upright because even if you do something and nobody knows about your this particular internal bio spiritual parasite does know and it will transmit this knowledge to the heavens and the punishment will follow um so it's not so much against humanity it's more like um an effort in in terms of the system it's an effort to keep people um to push people towards more ethical upright behavior okay perfect thank you very much uh, actually if uh, while we wait for other uh, questions or comments i did have a question of my own or a more than a question is um, a, a curiosity of mine because I was wondering what was the uh, research process uh, behind such a research, such a, uh, such a lecture. The, oh, the, the research process? So yeah. how did I come up with all this information? Yes. Um, well, there's, there's quite a bit of information that the Japanese, um, and I, I do have an article about this in a book, um, I think it's called Japanese Development. I forget what the book's called, but it's um it's an edited volume. Came out in 2015, and mm -hmm. there's a, a lengthy bibliography at the end. Um, I had I was living in Japan, and I was looking into Taoist presence of Taoism in Japan, and there are articles by Japanese scholars that talk about. <clears throat> what kind of um, what different aspects of Taoism entered Japan at what time and what kind of role they played and this was mentioned as one of them and so um, then there's plenty of there's this one um, scholar called Kubo Kubo Noritada 
and he has like a three or four volume collection of materials on this. And some of it is historical where he pulled together a lot of those Koshin Engi, those local records. He has a lot of those as the Koshin scripture. Um, these various mentions that I refer to, um, he has the actual quotation in there. And then he has, um, he did like field work. So he went to a lot of different communities and that was done in like the 60s, 60s, 70s. It's been a while. Um, but he has large amounts of materials um, how different communities in, in the late 20th century were still actively um, continuing to do this. So, so there's quite a bit of Japanese work on this. And then some scholars, um, I think Yoshioka Yoshitoyo, who's one of the great researchers, has, he has a three volume series called Dokyo to Bukyo, Taoism and Buddhism, published again in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, he has a whole big article on Shoman Congo, on the blue faced Vajrapani, and how that cult you know, came out of, um, I think it's an Indian thing, and then it got into China, and then eventually it got connected to the Koshin cult, and then um, in Japan. So so the, the connection to Koshin of Shoman Congo is it's sort of borderline. It's right around the time. It's hard to know whether it was already there in China, or it was just a little bit there in China, and then really flourished in Japan. That, I think, is the conclusion he came to. Um, so there's, there's that kind of research. And then myself being a Tao scholar, I could go back into the Taoist texts and find out of the, the more um, early sources. So that was, um, for me, that was not that hard to do. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. If there are any other questions, I want to thank you, Professor, for your time. Uh, and I want to thank you, everybody who has come today. And I wish you all a pleasant evening. And and bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.